Oh, you ready for today's giveaway? It's a huge one. The Maps Super Bundle. That's what you can get for free. By the way, here's what's in the Super Bundle. Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, Maps Aesthetic, Maps Prime, and I think there's more. I think we have more stuff in there as well. You can get all of that for free. You got to do the following though. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode on YouTube to help us with the algorithm. We're trying to beat the YouTube algorithm. If you do that and you subscribe to this channel and you turn on your notifications and we pick your comment as the best comment, you'll get all that stuff for free for life. Isn't that freaking awesome? Yes, it is. Also, we're running a sale right now on two MAPS workout programs. If you're interested in high-intensity interval training, that's HIIT training, but you want to do it the right way where you burn body fat, don't lose muscle, you feel good, MAPS HIIT is the program. That's 50% off right now. If you're interested in advanced bodybuilding training, you want to sculpt and train your body, you've got experience with resistance training, you've been doing it for a couple of years, well, then you want to follow MAPS SPLIT. That's also 50% off. So both programs, 50% off. Here's how you can sign up or learn more. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, and then you have to use this code for that discount, DEC50. So DEC50 will give you 50% off. All right, here comes the show. All right, look, it's almost impossible to gain body fat from eating a lot of protein. All right, guys, let's talk about this for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I remember the first time that um, I kind of figured this out. We've talked we, on the show when uh, – when we piece together the processed foods, uh, you know, tip, right. Telling clients to stop eating processed foods. And I wish I remember, like, if it was something that I kind of like did myself first, and then I was like, Oh wow, I wonder if this works with clients, but I were, and, and your baked potato thing that you always talk about, like try eating like four or five baked potatoes with nothing on it. And it's like impossible, yeah. you know, but yet you could crush a bag of potato chips. Uh, proteins, like it's similar that way. If, if you're getting and that, I think that's, that's the, the, the one caveat to that. What you're saying is that if it's uh whole foods that you're getting that protein, cause you could probably get fat off of eating processed foods that are full of protein or yeah, there's that, protein Snickers bars now. So, right. I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, so there's two things to this. One is what you're saying. Protein is extremely satiating. It's really hard to just overeat a lot of protein cause it just, you hit a wall. You don't want to eat more. This is what. If you ever talk to anybody who's ever done a carnivore diet, they'll tell you, like, I just, oh. I can't eat anymore. That's the biggest issue is, like, really trying to be able to eat enough calories. It's it's really difficult. You get so full, and, uh, and it's just, like, it's just too much to where I, I'm not even hungry after. Yeah. Well, like, do you guys remember when, the calories. when we all went on the ketogenic diet way early on? So before we had, I think it was before we even had Dom on the show, and we were, it was just getting kind of popular. And we did state. a high-protein version. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, um, and then we all decided we'd run it. And we do it. And I would just happen to be in the middle of like still, I think just wrapping up competing even. Or you were was, trying to bulk. Yeah I, was, yeah, I was in a bulk. And I was like, okay, well, let's just try and do this. And I remember I just, how hard it was. And that's kind of what made me kind of throw in the towel was, dude, I just, I'm not able to eat 5,000 calories of just proteins and fats. Like you fill yeah. up so fast. Yeah, so there's two parts to this. So first off, I, I do want to be clear. If you eat more calories than you burn, you will gain uh, body yeah, that's fat. science. Right, that's <laughs> science. But here's why I made that statement about protein. One is what we just talked about. It's incredibly satiating, so it's hard to overeat protein in comparison to carbohydrates and fats, But number, especially carbohydrates. But number two, they've done studies where they've bumped people's calories through carbohydrates, fats, or just proteins. And at the end of these studies, what they found is that the, the increase in calories that came from proteins resulted in less fat gain and some muscle gain. That's even if calorie, all things equal? Yeah. That's interesting. Mm. Yeah. Now, now here's the speculation. The speculation is, one, protein has this incredible thermic effect. So eating more protein means your body tends to burn more calories. So the, the, you know, the calories in versus calories out, like that rule of thermodynamics, it still stands, right? It's a, it's a rule of physics. But eating a lot of protein tends to change the calories out side of the formula. Eating more of it tends to make your metabolism burn more calories. And then the second part is we all know that, and, and again, this is clear in studies as, uh, as well, eating a higher protein diet tends to lead to more muscle gain. And what does more muscle do? It burns more calories. So if you're eating a lot more protein and, versus other the other macronutrients and your calories are high, you're less likely uh, to gain body fat in comparison to the others and or 
it's going to be hard to eat a lot more when it's just protein. Now, is there still information out there that's like sort of deterring people from this in terms of like the mTOR and like yeah. can cancer sort of being a scare with that? Yeah, so uh, so mTOR is uh, mammalian target rapamycin. I think I'm saying that right. And this... Because I remember these things. Yeah, it's just... Mammalian. Yeah, listen, I don't remember a lot of things. It's funny. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'll be with my family and they'll ask me certain questions. I'll be like, I have no idea. And I'll yeah. remember something random. Or we'll have a meeting, just a meeting just, and 30 minutes later he forgets what he's supposed to do afterwards. Uh, completely. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's a skill that's good for podcasting. So thank you, God, for this. <laughs> help me find this, oh, it's perfect. this career. Yeah. Uh, anyway... So this particular, um, you know, mTOR signals muscle growth, but it drives the growth of a lot of things. If you spike mTOR when you have cancer, you'll probably accelerate the growth of cancer. So people will say things like, high-protein diets will increase your risk of cancer. Not true. By the way, carbohydrates also feed cancers, and even fats in some cases, although not as often, can feed some cancer. So there's a difference between an environment where cancer is present and in, in a healthy environment. In a healthy environment, and by the way, if you have cancer, a lot of things change. There's a lot of things that you need to change and modify. In some cases, they'll put you on hormone-blocking drugs and other things, which, which normally would be a bad thing. So that's the thing to consider. But when you're healthy, and the studies with healthy people, high-protein diets um, are not only perfectly healthy. In fact, a study just came out showing that in older populations, higher-protein diets are connected to lower causes of all – to lower – risks, excuse me, of all-cause mortality. Again, probably because higher protein diets result in, in more strength gains or at least strength preservation. And we know now how strongly connected strength is to all-cause mortality as you age. The stronger you are when you're older, the less likely you are to die from, you know, from all different causes. Well, this is where that, that tip comes from too, where we tell people to you know, eat protein first. So you sit down and you get your yes. your plate instead of filling up on the bread or the chips. Just eat the protein, protein and fats first, and then vegetables, and then move to like your um, starchy carbs. And many times, just by telling somebody the order that they eat like that uh, will limit the amount of carbohydrates and calories that they consume. And it's been like one of those tips that, and it just it's a it's a psychological thing too because you're not telling the client you can't have the carbs or you can't have the chips or you can't have the bread. It's just, Hey, go eat your protein and fats and veggies first, and then go ahead and enjoy that. And many times what ends up happening by the time you get to those, you're just full. Yeah. I think there's also this myth that, and there's some truth to this, that because humans evolved for, for the vast majority of human history where food was scarce, that we evolved to just eat when food is in front of us and we'll just eat ourselves to death. There's a little bit of truth to that, but in reality, but the truth is there's a lot of uh, falseness in that in the sense that our bodies, even back then, had safeguards against uh, overeating because it would have killed you back then just like it does today. Maybe not obesity. That would have been much more difficult to, to, to accomplish, but like overeating and damaging your, your digestive system or causing yourself to feel sick. So, you know, we do this hunt, we kill this animal or we come across this, you know, naturally growing tree with fruit on it. Even it was still detrimental for us to just eat until we made ourselves sick, even back then. So, we have these natural safeguards and it's satiety yeah. and we hit it. But the way we get around it now is we take different flavors and foods and combine them in ways, usually engineer them in ways to make you want to make you eat even more and more to kind of get past that barrier because those barriers that we have evolved with whole natural foods and evolved with where sugar was quite rare. I mean, tell me where you would find sugar in nature, not with like modern agriculture, none of that stuff. If you're- It's fruit. Yeah, fruit, but barely. Yeah. Like yeah. you, you might find some berries. Yeah, they're bitter for the most part. Yeah, yeah. or an apple. And apples, and apples back then were like full of seeds and, yeah. and lots of fiber. Yeah, I remember, I remember seeing an article that like compared like a, our fruit today versus fruit just like a hundred years ago. Did you like know that- dramatically different it You was. can look at old paintings from the Renaissance like of fruit. Like bananas and stuff. Yeah, and they're sliced open. Don't even and, look the same. No. Yeah. Bananas are full of seeds. Apples are very little flesh. Uh, you know, fruit was way less- uh, packed with sugar. That's just how it occurred in nature. Now we we bred them to make them like super delicious. And so, do you not think that after a, a big hunt back in the days that you you wouldn't gorge out on the food, or you just couldn't because it's all meat that you were consuming? And so, because that it it wasn't super palatable, it wouldn't I hijack would, those systems. I think you definitely would eat until you were satisfied. Because yeah, you, you definitely would do that. That would be silly if you don't eat for a week and then finally you get a kill. Mm -hmm. Everybody is eating as much as they possibly can, probably to until they are almost feel sick. I 
yes, thing. Yes, but the those barriers that satiety signal that uh, palate fatigue kicked in. So you'd eat and eat and eat like man, I can't eat anymore. Now what you what you and this is from looking at studies of modern hunter gatherers, the foods that are uh, prioritized or the parts of the animal that are prioritized tend to be the organs and the fatty parts. Mm -hmm. So we would eat those first, obviously the most nutrient dense, like animal liver is so packed full of nutrients. It's like the nature's right. multivitamin. So we'd eat that first, eat the fatty parts first, and then all the lean tissue was leaf was left, uh, you know, for later on, or, or if it went bad, it went bad. I mean, in fact, there's something called, I think I talked about this once on a podcast. I think it's called uh, rabbit starvation, or I think that might be the term. Right. This is where trappers- Hunt Trappers up in Alaska, right? Yeah, yeah. or even in, in the West. You Because the meat's long not time, fatty enough? Yeah, they would yeah. catch lots of rabbits, and they would still, still starve. starve to death. You see because that on that, uh, that alone show. Oh, yeah. You've seen that. you seen, I remember like one of the seasons, the guy got like a buffalo or something, like a really lean animal. No, it was an elk. A moose? A, yeah. And, Maybe a moose and the, and the fat know. got stolen. Yeah, by it like wasn't a, an elk. It was like a, either a moose or like a buffalo I or saw something. That. Yeah, it was one of those that are like really lean meats. And you would think that that's enough meat for, I mean, that's enough technically meat for someone to live off of for a year. Uh, and it still wasn't enough for him because I, he ended up, I remember like the Wolverines got his, uh, the, his fat. Li the fatter, the fat and the liver. And so all he had was this lean meat. And then he was like starving. Yeah. I remember yeah, that. He, he, he literally, he took all the fats and he separated them and put them in this, like, uh, he thought like animals wouldn't get to it. And the freaking Wolverine got to it, stole it yeah. all. And all he had left was lean meat. How crazy, how frustrating would that be? Oh, You're going to starve to death that you have all this meat. Yeah. Right? And it's right there in front of you. It just makes me think, I mean, how it's just so interesting where we are now, where we can select like, uh, vegetable based meats, or we can, we can engineer these kind of meats that aren't even from animals. How, how do you even get satiated from that? Yeah. How do you even get that signal? It's like, to me, it's interesting. Like, is it mainly from nuts and from beans? It's like, that's like for like a vegan, like that's gotta be really difficult to ever feel like you're fully so satisfied. You ever seen the, the ingredient list on the like, beyond meat? Doug, maybe you should pull this well, it's up. all like vegetable oils and, and there's, there's like 50 before. ingredients. Yeah, in there. no, it's crazy. It's there's like, a bunch super, of things it's like super now, science. How, how long do you think you need to be like monk like before you become in tune naturally to those systems? Cause they're there still. Right. Like, and I feel like we talk about all the time about trying to become aware of those natural signs that your body's trying to tell you, no, don't eat this or you're full already. Like, you know, how long do you think it's for somebody who has like no connection at all to them and distracted all the time? Like, how long would they have to be like monk like to get reconnected to them? I think it's a constant practice, dude. Because well, it is because you're 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 you're, you're, taking, in, you're taking insults from the the opposite side, right? The yeah. TV, the phone, the you know stress, work, like, and then you've got all this incredible food all around you, and it's super tasty and exp inexpensive and really easy to get. I think it's a constant practice, dude. This is, is like there, a, is there is there stuff to support like people who live like in rural areas versus in like cities that would are technically would used be to be not anymore. It used to be that way because rural areas didn't have access, but now our markets are so damn effective that people are obese everywhere. In fact, in certain cities, people are less obese because the cities were designed before cars were invented. So people yeah, have to so walk. walk around everywhere. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't matter, dude, where you're at now, you're going to be, you're, you've got this food accessible and yeah. you're going to, and it's, it's going to be a pro it is a problem. So yeah. yeah, let me, let's look at this ingredient list, Doug, when he pulls it up. What, it, what does that show here? Let's see. Water, pea protein, expeller press, canola oil, coconut oil, rice protein, natural flavors, which is, I don't know how many other things, cocoa yeah, butter, mean? mung bean protein, Methyl cellulose, potato starch, apple extract, pomegranate extract, salt, potassium chloride, vinegar, lemon juice, concentrate, sunflower, lecithin, beet juice extract. The beet juice, by the way, is to make it look bloody. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So I, I'm yeah. not a fan of this argument, though, by the way. That's why the I know you're bringing it up to, to make a point. Like if you look, you flip meat around, it's just meat. But like when you just break, you say all those things. For the most part, most of those things are in a lot of foods. It's the, and it's the fact that there's the, all the combinations. No, I get it. Yeah. I get it. You know, but I, I just I think it's a weak argument. It's a weak argument. Yeah, to, yeah, I, th I agree. I know what you're going because if that. you because I guarantee if you and I were to extract everything that's in there, you'd be like, oh yeah, I eat that and other things, or I've had that. Like they're not. It's not that horrific. You know, it's not as bad as if I turn around my rock star and look at what's in the back yeah. of that. You know, that's probably a lot worse for me than than this thing is is totally and that's kind of like the go-to 
argument that everybody leans on is like, look at this. There's 70 things in here versus No, yeah, one. it's just not. It, it doesn't really compare to actual meat, I think is the point. Well, it's yeah. not. And that, that to me, that's a better argument is the, uh, the how nutrient-dense meat is. And I, I think that would be a better way to explain it is like, look at all the health benefits you get, get from eating real meat and show that versus, okay, you can – put all these things in here to try and emulate this, but look at the the value of this versus to me, that's a better argument than the look what's in it, like scare tactic to yeah. how much stuff. You know, it's it. funny. It's uh, the, the demise of how we value meat really started happening. Once we started separating ourselves from the process of raising and killing meat. Mm -hmm. as soon as we separated that you had these huge, you know, slaughter factories with animals being you know run through and treated a certain way and pumped full of hormones or whatever because we're not connected to it yeah. and then people never kill an animal themselves so they have no respect for it and they go to the grocery store and they just see the meat in the plastic and then because they have no respect uh they don't understand the value and so like i'm not going to eat meat anymore and a lot of people run into problems with that because you have to be more you can definitely be vegan and be healthy for sure you just have to be much more planned, and it also wouldn't be possible without modern grocery stores and modern markets. There's just so much variety now. You can get all the nutrients you need, whereas you know, a thousand years ago, uh, you would starve. You would starve if you didn't eat any meat. So yeah, yeah. it's uh, you know, it's really interesting. Well, while we're on the food topic, did you guys see the 850-pound uh, pot brownie that was made? Dude. <laughs> what? <laughs> 20,000 milligrams of THC. Yeah. 850 pounds? Yeah, I think the company, I think Medimar or something like that, I think is the name of the company. They claim to have made the largest <laughs> pot brownie in the world at 850 Why? pounds. I have no idea. <laughs> so you could say. How I many mean, people are you going to invite over to from try a, and From a marketing standpoint, I mean, here we are talking about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, I can't be the first person to bring it up. You know, I read it in some other big yeah. article or whatever like that. So You can invite 1,000 people over and everybody gets super smashed. Super. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, probably, I mean, really probably a, just a, a smart strategy to get attention because everyone's good the wow yeah. factor of looking at it and being like oh my god like imagine how hot Dude, you would how be. sad by the way how sad is this that there's people that literally they just made Look this at, pot brownie that's massive there's no way they actually put all that pot in there either that's oh 20,000 you can fit in that easily dude no oh yes you can bro I've seen a thousand milligrams in a cookie no I know I'm saying that they didn't do that because that would have cost them too much money like they could just yeah that say would be that. really expensive to do yeah, that right that, to produce that's a, that I remember or it'd be w wasteful to do that right you right. could use it to to produce a it's bunch not even of eat yeah, it. but it's a publicity stunt. Yes, it, it's that. But you know what's sad about this? They did this, get all kinds of news. There's still people in federal prison for for marijuana are. laws. Yeah. Is it still? I, I thought we started letting a lot of that out. No, no, no. Well, no, there's still people in there serving their terms. So wow. there's people who got caught in the in the 90s trafficking a bunch of you know cannabis, and I mean, in the 90s, if you got caught with 20,000 milligrams worth of weed, like THC, you're going to jail for like. Decades. So imagine you're sitting in jail right now, oh, yeah. and you're like on you're like on 15 years, and you read this damn article. I would be so mad, dude. Oh, they just yeah. made a pop brownie, yeah, and I'm just still in jail. It in your face. I had this conversation with Mike earlier because he he's he's uh, Matthews. Know, no, no, our friend Mike. Uh oh. Uh, and we Funny gave Mike. Yeah, and we gave I gave him um, some hemp oil, and we were talking about cannabinoids and. I'm like, man, you know that they they made they literally made that elite like like schedule one specifically to target the counterculture. It was 100 percent a political move to be able to throw protesters in jail because they had to figure out a way to do it. Yeah. So like their number one drug is weed. Let's make that the you know the 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 schedule one or whatever. Pretty, and by the way, there was a study. I haven't talked about this in a long time. I remembered it while I was talking to him. Do you know that one of the first studies that showed cannabinoids and their anti-cancer effects was a government studied uh, excuse me, government funded study in 1974. Mm. They did a study trying to connect smoking marijuana to lung cancer. And halfway through, they saw that there was a small anti-cancer, very small anti-cancer effect. And they, they stopped the study and classified it. And it only got released later because of the Freedom of Information Act, I think. Yeah. When people are like, wait a minute, why'd you guys stop this study? Oh, I know why. <laughs> just, yeah. just show it's not that convenient the, information. I know. Isn't that isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Speaking of crazy stuff, yeah, I'm gonna tell you guys something that's super annoying. So obviously inflation's exploding. I think we hit a new record, right? Seven percent highest in forty years. Yeah. So yeah. we're crushing with that right <laughs> now. Woo! What, you, you know man. what's funny though is the the news articles coming out around it are cracking me up, dude. Like the spin, the spin on oh the, like the positive gosh, part. Dude. So okay, now let's uh, let's play the you know a prediction game that we always play here. Uh, there, I believe there is a like a five trillion dollar bill on the table right now. 
Now, this new, uh, I think we can say it's not transitory anymore, or, we, or is that because it's been hanging oh, around? Oh, inflation? Yeah, it's been oh, hanging no, around here, five yeah. plus and climbing, right? So I think it's no it's longer transitory. Yeah. So based off of that, does does this does this bill get killed, or do they does Congress still push it through, and we still now we we print out five trillion dollars? What's I th your? Th I think I think at the le at the the best they're going to pass something that's trillions of dollars. Maybe it's not the five trillion or whatever, but they'll pass. They'll so is like, that your prediction? Is that yeah. like you know half of it will get passed? Yeah, some something in the trillions. Why would they? Why would they stop it? I mean, at this well, because point, it's they getting, keep printing money. Like, yeah, but I mean, part of their theory on printing money before was that this was going to be transitory and we would return back to normalcy. And the fact that it's it's not and it's continuing to rise, printing more money is only going to make it accelerate. Yeah, but you're speaking. And even, yeah, I know, but that's really logical. Logically, I guess. Well, I guess my point is like they've been successfully able to keep hitting that button. Well, it's kind of like their, their their hand has been caught in the cookie jar now, and I feel like it's like, are you really still going to try and reach in there and grab another one, even though you've I think already so. been caught? You know, okay. Dude, everything I've seen so far is keep throttling as as fast and as you know. Okay, as I'm going to be quick the as we can. I'm going to come out. I'm totally naked. Negative, dude. Like okay. everything out there is just <laughs> well, in mean, my well, favor. It's all negative. So just to be full pessimist is going like, to say they're going to they're going to nobody the five stopping trillion these through. Right, let me, You're going to say let me go uh, next. They're going to go. They're going to probably lobby no, against a little bit. It'll dude, be around. No, two. there's me, no accountability. No, let me be Where's a little more accountability. Let me be a little bit more specific before you go, Adam, because you're going to go positive. So I'm going to go be a little more specific. Here's the two options that they have: do huge spending bills or raise taxes and interest rates. Which one is going to be? Provide more what pain. were you and I just watching? What did we and we heard someone. <laughs> Nobody say, wants to do that. Who, right? What was it we were watching? Was it when we were in the hotel room when they, when he said like, "Oh, I'm going to do this and we won't have to pay any more taxes." Oh my God, it was Biden. Oh, what did he say though? Bro, Biden was I like, fell, fell out of "We're going to provide this. We're going to provide that. We're not going to raise a single dollar of taxes, and it's not going to cost us any money." I'm like, <laughs> "That's what it was." Like, Wait you a have second. Magic? <laughs> we, we found a money tree. Yeah. Yeah. Kazam. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, okay, either raise interest rates. Increase taxes okay. or inflate. Okay. Okay. Which one was more likely to get blamed on politicians if they goes through with the pain, right? The interest rates and taxes. Which one are they going to pass the buck on? Inflation. In fact, the propaganda already started. Yep. You know what they're doing right now? And mm. I'm seeing articles uh, on this. And I'm seeing political pundits say this bullshit too. They're blaming the rise in prices on companies price gouging. I swear to God, this is what they're saying. <laughs> They're saying the reason why bacon companies is, are taking advantage. Yes, the That's reason why right. bacon is fifty percent more expensive is because baking companies are like, "Hey, we could totally raise prices and people will pay more." Yeah. That's not how it works. If I'm in a competitive market and I have a product, I wish my consumer, my my competitors had to raise their prices. Now I'm going to crush them. It doesn't work that way. It's right. not price gouging. Sorry, these prices are reflecting what's going on. But they're already starting the propaganda machine. And inflation is their favorite way to tax people without people realizing because it, it's easy to pass the buck. All right, go yep. positive. Yeah, yeah. I dare you. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm I got nothing. I'm gonna be the the optimist of the group, and I want to believe that they're they're gonna shut it down. So I, I'm gonna say they're not gonna pass it so, at all, like yeah, zero? at all zero. Yeah, I think I think that we have to, at least uh, for now. I mean, I think that it's it's so out of control. I think you can't pitch the transitory uh, thing anymore. That it's it's here. It's here to stay. Uh, in fact, it's probably inevitable. It's going to get worse. Mm. And so by printing any more money, it's only going to make that situation 10 times worse. So I think that. So I'm going to be your political opponent right Dude. now. So you said that, which is yeah. true and yeah. honest and yeah. logical. Yeah. So now, <laughs> now I'm going to be. It's not good politics. Now I'm going to crush you in politics. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, Everybody's wait just going to blame somebody else and keep passing the buck. Yeah. I'm going to say like this. Like they do what, every time. Adam, you don't, want to, you don't want to build new bridges and create new jobs and fix our our crumbling infrastructure. You want to cancel this bill when Americans need work the most yeah. and people need the most help. Yeah. You lose, I win. I mean that's going to be the, trillion, that's going to be the pitch you know you you don't think that a lot of people are kind of I mean you you brought it up the other day about his approval rating right now so most people are pretty upset. I think most people see the writing on the wall now, don't you think or no? I think they do, but hmm. they don't they don't understand. People well, don't yeah. understand inflation, they don't yeah. understand what's happening. They see that this new bill is going to get passed. We're going to create jobs with it. By the way, okay, government doesn't create jobs. They take money from producers and they spend it on stuff that they think is valuable. Through the process, you automatically lose wealth because there's a massive bureaucracy that administers and it. And you also have to pay off the special interest groups. That's we don't it. We'll talk about that. Yeah, and then, and then who knows if what I'm building is going to have market viability because there's no pressures on it. So I'm going to build it and then who knows and we'll see what happens. So it's really, I mean, literally I could be like, 
I'm going to create a thousand jobs and here's your job. You're going to dig a hole and fill it back up and we're going to pay you. And how are we going to pay you? We're going to just print money or I'm going to tax these people. Over Speaking here. of jobs, I heard that it, I heard that it's, it's pointless to even pay attention to unemployment rate. And the reason being, I, this was very interesting. I've never heard this before that as, as tech, like for example, 50 years ago or 50, 60 years ago, the skills that you needed to be in the workforce is so different than now that it, that keeps leveling up while we're not getting more educated now, maybe as a, a whole, like we, we are, but there's a larger per, that the percentage of people that are hmm. uneducated are growing at a faster rate and the jobs are getting further out of reach. And so it's inevitable that that number is always going to continue to get worse. Hmm. I thought that was really interesting. I well, had never, never heard anyone make that point before. And it makes a lot of sense. When you think about, think about our parents' parents, the, like the, the jobs you do to a lot of them were like, labor like oh, yeah. you know what i'm saying that the skills required to learn how to do it you could get hired so not saying any tiktok influencing isn't paying off <laughs> yeah yes yeah. not a real career <laughs> yeah. Yeah. what the fuck I, well i don't know according to um unemployment numbers they're it's pretty low but one thing they don't tell you is how many people stop looking because those people are off that so if you say that you're not looking for a job right even though you're unemployed they don't count that so i don't know that's uh, another reason why i hear it's not very important it's like you can, we, we're not tracking that, which that's just as important too, right? Yeah, I have, I don't know, I have. No but isn't idea. that interesting when you think about that? I, you know, I was like, wow, it is kind of inevitable that's going to continue to get worse. Then, like, if if we are if we're not getting smarter as a whole, and the jobs are you know being replaced with AI, and it's requiring you to be smarter, that you either have to be able to run AI, you mean have more skills, yeah, more yeah. skills than what just 50, 60 years ago. And it is when you think about jobs, what they look like. It, well, it's well, okay. wasn't it? Isn't it just like when um, Google like announced they're having like yes. more of that? Uh, in-house education where you, certificates you could just go direct uh you know right out of like yeah, high school i think the market will answer that i think that's that's the move it's really just getting more skilled within that specific trade i do too i think like in tech especially let's say you get a, a four-year degree in tech like by at the speed at which it's advancing at the end of your degree what you learn the first two years might even become kind of obsolete so companies like uh, google and apple and others are creating their own education systems, and then their six-month certificate is equivalent to a four-year degree, not just for them. There's other companies that are accepting these certificates as well. So I think it's going to keep doing that. Um, as far as education is concerned, we are more educated than we were 50 years ago, generally speaking. More yeah, people, generally yeah. speaking, but we're the 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 skills required for jobs is outpacing that. Well, you know what happens is that the high the jobs that are at such high demand and require high skill. For example, I read this article. I think I sent it to you on uh, like uh, computer engineers. Do you know the difference between a the productivity of what they would consider a superstar computer engineer and your average uh, engineer? No. It's crazy. I don't think you said this. Yeah. So, the, so one of the founders of Netflix, it wasn't the gentleman that we interviewed. It was one of the other ones. But he said that they had a, they had a, um, a meeting where they had to decide how many computer engineers or engineers or coders are we going to hire – to create this new, you know, product, this new service, and he says he he had a budget to hire. I think it was eight engineers, but he remembered learning about these what are called superstar engineers that are hyper productive and really good. And so, rather than paying eight engineers a you know engineer you know average salary, he hired one who was a superstar and paid him a fat salary, mm. and it worked. He said because of the the amount of productivity that these high level engineers can produce, one of them is equivalent to like twenty engineers. Oh yeah, that's which, just efficiency, which right is there. really crazy. So there's a huge discrepancy between these superstar you know coders and engineers and then your your typical one. And it's just like that guy that's on uh, Soylent and just never leaves his <laughs> fucking computer <laughs> for <laughs> just all day. Dude, yeah. speaking of uh, tech. Did you guys read the article on these new eye drops that just got approved by the FDA? Mm -hmm. Eye drops. Oh, and bro. tech. No. Uh -huh. Okay, technology. It's really crazy. So they created eye drops that can eliminate the use of reading glasses. What? Yeah. So you use these eye drops. So it's a temporary. It effect? must be like a film that gives yeah. you like no. A, like a no. No, no, no. So what it and it lasts for like I think it's like twelve hours or ten hours. So you put these eye drops in. So the problem with people reading uh, when they when they start to get older and they have trouble reading things up close is the muscles of the eye, the ones that constrict the pupil, 
start to become less flexible and you start to lose that ability. So you might have good vision far away, but then when you look up close, your, your eye can't adjust in, you know, reduced light or I don't know what happens if your pupils grow or Justin's shrink. listening intently right yeah, now. I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah, so... I'm like squeezing my <laughs> eyes. <laughs> but the people on the podcast don't ever get to see this, but when, when Justin's like this all the time, whenever he's, he's thinking hard. Yeah, when it's his turn to look at the notes, he's like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like where's this going? <laughs> yeah, it looks like an old man. Yeah. No, at it. <laughs> Do you have the worst eyes out of all of us? Probably. For sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I are you far? Well, what near? color are your eyes? What color are your eyes? Color? Yeah. What, you can, well, can't you see them? Well, no. Well, I can't now. You <laughs> well, look see at the opposite because I well, can't see well, no, people far. My feelings are hurt right now. You know my eye color? The reason why, well, <laughs> we've been no, together for like No, you know that, that somebody who, it's like Justin has lighter, brown someone who has yeah. lighter color eyes is uh, way more likely to have eye problems than someone who has dark colored eyes. You really? know that? Oh, is you that, didn't know that? Oh, is that because the UV goes in and Oh, you didn't know that? Oh, look up. I know that like my fair skin and like redhead, I know specifically has a higher pain threshold. Oh, he's like, I gotta say something cool. He's like, oh. you guys are wimps. I could take it at a more pace. Yeah, maybe maybe Andrew could look it up for us since Doug stepped out in the middle of our podcast. I think, he had, yeah, I think he had diarrhea. We <laughs> lost our Google. We, <laughs> we lost, we lost we our Google. Talk shit today. about him because he That's stepped out. When Doug leaves, <laughs> we're gonna talk shit about him all the time. No, you guys didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, look it up, Google Maps. No, I mean like I know I'm more squinty as a result. No, right? if like, you have yeah, light colored eyes, I mean it's a it's like dramatically different, Sal. Like the likelihood you'll wear glasses if you have blue eyes is extremely higher than if someone has brown eyes. I mean it kind of makes sense in terms of if. You, like it, for your I, skin with pig, pigmentation. So I'm going to guess before I look it up, it has to do with UV damage because maybe um, oh, darker. Did you just hire, hijack it, Andrew? Look at this, oh, Andrew. Look at Andrew. Oh, yeah. see, we got see what happens, plan. Doug? What's we got a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> You've been Doug just lost that, his job. What does that say right there? Can you expand up on that right there? Although, Although bright, right. brightness may be an issue for light eyed people, it is not directly related to the quality of their eyes and so, eyesight. I still got quality. In dude. general, science has not found evidence that people with darker eyes have intently better vision than those with uh, paler. Oh, so not better vision, but they're more likely to ha have to wear glasses. To have like what? Isn't oh. that the same thing? No, no, I don't it's think it's not? the same thing. Because oh, it's because what you're saying is what it's saying right now. How which about is this? The, the UV this. rays, Doug. Have you, you know that? I don't know. If Look, that that people with white eyes are more theory. likely to have to wear or wear eyeglasses than people with dark eyes. Like eyeglasses for seeing? Yes. Wow. Well, hold on. Uh, yeah, sure I, what else I do not know. Glasses. Look what I'm reading right now. How's your stomach feel, Doug? Is that? Did you have a good one? <laughs> no, I had a phone call. Oh, okay, today. My bad. Uh, so the second part, look at this says, this means that dark eyed people. So there's another part that says that dark eyes excelled at reactive tasks while those with light eyes were better at self paced tasks. So this means that dark eyed people scored better in areas like hitting balls mm. and playing defense while light eyed people scored highly when it came to throwing balls, bowling or hitting golf balls. I don't know if that's true, dude. I was a defender. Uh, so I just, uh, you know, yeah. I'm going to do my own homework. I'm over. an outlier. Yeah. Well, anyway, these eye drops, you put them in your eyes, and it it improves your ability to read at close uh, distance. So it could eliminate the need for reading glasses with eye trip. drops. That's a trip. It is, right? Yeah. Now, it just got FDA approved, so I don't know if I would necessarily want to put this in my eyeballs yeah see what happens yeah later yeah. you find out it's just like eroding your eyeballs <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> it wasn't a good idea i don't have to wear glad 10 years later you know, you have yeah, come on andrew know. what are you pulling up here the first article i pull up says how eye color impacts your vision your eye color is unique to you in fact no two people have the exact same eyes uh, blah, 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 blah. one of the most distinguishing characteristic people is a big part of this our expert <laughs> Light versus dark. You know what it is? I clicked on it and then it brought me to another part yada, of the article. Yada, yada. The, the, the <laughs> Did I get there yet? No. Yeah, dude. Uh. I used to, there was Whether a, you have light or dark colored eyes, your, your eye color does actually have an impact on your vision. Okay. If you, okay. If you have a lighter eye color, your eyes are more sensitive to light because you have less pigment and yeah, melanin. For UV. And, you're, and rises to protect uh, your eyes from the sun. I mean, that was the only this means that you could have a greater risk make. of degeneration and that you might find yourself squinting more outside during the day. So yes, it does. I'm now, a squinter. I mean, I'm now a squinter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm and, and if you have darker eyes, you can you're more often withstand high glare lights better than light colored eyes can. Yeah, you more have, likely to wear eyeglasses. You have really dark eyes, Adam. Come on, Andrew. Very mysterious. Look into the camera. Let's zoom in real quick. Yeah, huh? he, look he's like a shark. Look at yeah. that. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ooh, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so, Exotic. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to admit now I cheated because I had LASIK eye surgery. Oh, come on. Way long time ago. Yeah. I actually had it like maybe 15 years ago. Do you know that? No. Yeah, I did. I had really bad. Uh, I was really bad at looking at seeing things far away. Yeah. And uh, that's I where in, I'm at. I went in and got it done and it's still good. My eyes now are 20. Last time I got a check was 2010 in one eye and 2015 in the other. 
Wow. Which is really good. Nobody really cares. That has nothing yeah. to do with our argument. Right? <laughs> Great stats. Shut your, <laughs> Shut your mouth. I wish this was a Felix Gray commercial. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, yeah. this, then yeah. I could totally tie yeah, it That would have been a good commercial for that. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't know we were going to I mean, go I here. got prescription. I wear all the time. Hey, like, if I'm I just reading, thought that was a random. Thing. I got something cool to tell you guys. Okay, let's hear it. I found out a, about a compound that has profound effects on the pump. That we don't know about? Water. Okay. Glutathione. It, glutathione? It, by the, glutathione. Why is this like the wonder drug all of a sudden? It's because like it's, for COVID yeah, and all kinds of COVID. stuff. It's the master. It's, like it's the, it's the uh, cannabis of 20, yeah, 2022. Dude. <laughs> it's really doing well. It's yeah. the master antioxidant. It actually increases the amount of nitric oxide. And they did studies on this. There was a study on glutathione that showed that people who supplemented with it, who exercised, had better strength gains as well. I swear to God. I'm not making this up. It's in the video. It'll be in the show notes. Look at that. Really? Yes. I mean, is it like a correlation leap, though? I mean, is it just no. like, really? No, it's like a it, direct effect to yes. the pump. Now, I don't remember. So, like, how many versions are at? Because I know the, the most effective one that we use is the, in those packets from Live On, right? Liposomal. But, yeah, yeah. So, it's like a gel and it's it's rough to get through it. Yeah. But, like, are there <laughs> other, like, versions out there that, like, are competitive that are, like, in a drink or, or like, pill form? Yeah. Well, the, the problem with glutathione is that the original studies on it showed all these benefits, but they were all um, done in intravenously so people had to go mm. directly to the blood because when you consume it it's destroyed in the gut and it, it doesn't get to your right. system so the old way of increasing glutathione in your blood was to supplement with nac which stands for n-acetylcysteine i think and by the way that's the supplement the fda now said uh, uh can't be sold over the counter because there were some studies it's showing effective that. let's get rid of it, it yeah, it's, yeah it's effective against right. a certain type of uh, what do you guys do you guys doing all the wrong commercials today what's going on you read no, the wrong you no. reading the you read the same show notes i'm reading yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, no no we're gonna work our way through hey, all the look. partners but the commercials no, 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 no. i see that's we're where we're going real real information no no actually uh we're gonna we'll uh, live on will be mentioned in the in the middle oh, okay, of this okay. episode but okay. nonetheless the the glutathione you want liposomal meaning it's surrounded by a fat so it's protected and studies show that liposomal glutathione does significantly raise glutathione in the blood. Mm. So, okay, but now, pre-workout, take it an hour before workout. I've been doing it, and it's I can tell. I swear to God. So yeah. I, I took mine today. Now, what's your recommendation for just like should you take one one of those little packets a day? Or I yeah. know when we when we were worried that everyone was sick in the house, you told me to jump it up to two or three times yeah. a day. Yeah. I mean, what's kind of like the, the the generic recommendation for that? Just one packet a day. But it, the key is to have your glutathione levels be high before you get sick. So once you're sick and then you're trying to get it to go up doesn't I mean, make sense better than nothing but, but it makes sense so then it does make sense for me to maybe do it too because i uh katrina and max both woke up sick i'm fine i don't feel anything coming on mm -hmm. yet but i should probably double triple up you're yeah. saying right yeah, now. okay yeah, yeah. And, and what else of theirs because i know they got the vitamin c and what's the other one that you have us doing you got me doing the green packet the the uh the which one the, like, i love giving out kind of stuff. purple yeah. packet and then the i think the gray one i'm I having you green take one. the acetyl l-carnitine yes um i'm having you take the glutathione and yep. the vitamin c packet yes so, so just, those three still yeah you just okay. take all three and then the b complex you could take two that one's that one's actually that one actually tastes kind of good mm. glutathione <laughs> i don't know about i mean that. it's yeah it's not offensive in comparison yeah yeah okay yeah if you if you compare the two yeah. then there might be yeah, yeah, an yeah. Issue. tallest midget yeah, anyway yeah. so uh so adam had a great time in arizona with you at the NCI event dude that was really good yeah t like tell me about it because obviously uh i had a little bit of fomo there so you guys got to really because he brought that up and i said I actually just, i take that completely back okay as a fucking liar anything see see, why you gotta <laughs> see lie, dude? now you gotta be careful for lying like that because him and i actually got in a little bit of a debate in the oh, really in the yeah no, I, like, I wanted to go hang out and like you know watch and be oh, a part of it but i, I right. didn't want to go speak i was right i <laughs> definitely didn't want to so do here's, what yeah. here's what i, I said here's what i said because we're doing that because we went to go speak on yeah. stage and you know adam and i whatever we like you know people looking at us i guess and so we went up there did the thing <laughs> and but <laughs> after me into that with you <laughs> but uh, come on bro like, only one of us posed on stage in little shorts <laughs> oh man <laughs> all right oh snap yeah uh, not not at the nci event doug just when he was competing oh I we see, uh, yeah he didn't do that there I surprise everybody yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. Hey. You that? no Doug was, so, Doug was over there picture me in little booty shorts yeah i <laughs> said let's bring justin because and even doug because uh this is all coaches and trainers right and this is who we talk to on the podcast all the time yeah. and afterwards they wanted to come up and ask us questions and meet us 
I'm like, man, this would have been great if we had the whole crew. And I said, fuck that. They wouldn't want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> and, he's, and he argued with me. And I said, well, if they want like, to come and I'll stay, that's fine with me. I said, I'd rather be in Palm <laughs> Desert sitting around a pool right well, now I, where he's probably at. Yeah, that's what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, and, and hiking. It was perfect weather. It was a great time. Anyways, tell me about you no, guys. It was, yeah. it was great, man. Yeah. There was, it was a room full of, it was like 200 something coaches and trainers. You know, these are our people. And he packed it, the house, man. Yeah. He yeah. Did. It was there, like when we it got there, like there was no chairs, people standing around. Uh, the wall, the building was completely. In fact, he was probably over the occupancy, and the fire marshal probably would have got him in trouble if yeah. they would have found out. But how many speakers were there besides uh, you guys and Jason? What would you say eight to ten? I think so, something like that. Yeah. I well, think it was so. three days too, so maybe even more, maybe twelve to fifteen of them. So yeah. a lot of the p other people that spoke besides Sal and I uh, are people in the coaching group that have gone through it and had like tremendous success. Oh, cool. So what he would do is basically have them come up and tell their story. Like, Oh, you know, I started coaching with Jason a year ago and now my business is doing six figures or I'm making all this money. So they come up and they kind of talk all about that. And Sal spoke on the first day and then I spoke on the second day and then we left. Uh, what I was most surprised with. So this, we did this two years ago. Yeah. Right? It was two or three years ago now. So two or three years ago. Yeah, it might, it might have been three years yeah, ago. Yeah, and this is really the first time that we've been out since Ohio trip for uh, our, whatchamacallit? Live event. Yeah, our live event. So it's been two years since we've kind of been out. And the show's had uh, a lot more growth, right, since then. Mm -hmm. And I could, because it was like in the exact same place, similar event, uh, he had even more people there. Uh, I wasn't anticipating that many like, like Mind Pump fans. Like everybody, the whole room, when Sal got up there and asked how many people listen to the show, literally the whole room raised their hand. Yeah. Well, I oh, mean, that's sick. that's our yeah. people. I mean, trainers and coaches are the ones that are really making, we know this because we did this. They're the ones making the big changes in the, you know, when it comes to health and fitness. And if we could speak to them to get in, for them to make those big changes with people, I mean, that's phenomenal. But it was a lot of fun. This, this one couple come, everybody was great, by the way. I loved everybody. But at one point there was this couple that came up and they're both coaches and the wife shakes my hand she goes i just want to let you know <laughs> you're gonna roll her into the bus <laughs> no this is good no this is good she goes i just want to let you know i love your show i listen to every episode but you know you're getting a shit sandwich when it starts but, like that uh, <laughs> she goes but i'm she goes i disagree with a lot of the stuff you say you know in regards to like economics and politics or whatever so i'm like okay so then afterwards i asked her cool. what what it was and we had this nice discussion but you know what it highlighted to me it highlighted to me how valuable health and fitness is. It's this, it's this, you know, growth model, this personal growth mechanism that doesn't matter where you come from. I don't care what your political beliefs are. I don't care what your religious beliefs are. All these other controversial areas of life, everybody can agree on improving your health and, mm -hmm. and the methods to do so. And there's some polarization in fitness and health too, especially recently, but it's not like other spaces. So it's great that she disagrees, you know, with some of the stuff I say, but listens to every episode and loves the fitness and health stuff. It's one of my favorite things about a space that way. I remember all my clients that were so different from each other. Oh, yeah. But we I, all agreed on that, you know. I don't know that I had many clients that I completely agreed with, with all that kind of stuff. But it was just about, like, getting better and improving and self-improvement and... Uh, you know, you had that common ground the whole time, so it didn't matter. Oh, I think that's what has led all of us to be kind of like we are, because I was the same. My clients that I had the longest, actually, I totally was socially and politically, like, we didn't see eye to eye at all. But I like that. Yeah. Like, I, I actually... So do I. I never held that again. You know, really, I never held that against anybody. No, it helped if me learn. If good people... It helped nice. me learn. If you, if you hang out with all people that agree with you... Right, a lot of times you get you get caught up in the rhetoric and it's just bullshit. Yeah. And it's just, you closing each other, and it's like you're not yep. really. Versus me listening to someone who totally disagrees without. Now I get to hear how they dismantle my point of view, and then either one it either strengthens my point of view or it changes my mind. And I think that yeah. I really like that as a as a trainer, getting people that were I thought were much smarter than I am who disagree with me. I learned a lot that way, so yeah. I enjoyed that. It's just a very positive. Uh, especially if you communicate it right and you have good intentions, you really want to help people. It's a very positive space. So the fact that we have such a wide range of people that listen to the show regularly who are interested in health and fitness, even though maybe they may disagree with us in certain things, I think it speaks volumes of the space that we're in. And it was nice because, again, we're talking to a room full of coaches and trainers. And here's the, the beautiful and challenging thing about working in the fitness space. We've said this before. It's if your goal is to make a ton of money, you pick the wrong space. Not not that you can't be successful in the fitness and health space, but if you just want to make money, get into finance or tech. The reason why people work in our space uh, and choose it as a career is for two. One, it 
changed their life significantly at some point. In fact, at one point during my talk, I told people, raise your hand and tell me why you got into this space to begin with. And people were sharing the craziest stories. Like it, I say it saved my life and you know, I was really obese and you know, I had these body image issues and it, it helped me and then I want to help others with it. And then the second part is you have a passion for helping people. So it's like you do this and you have all this purpose and meaning behind it. And then the second part is, okay, let me figure out how to make you support myself doing this. So it's a great space to work in. And that's one of the reasons why I love, you know, talking to trainers and coaches. Doug would have freaked out if he was there because I did what he hates. I went I went deep into like all the- Oh, you gave everybody a number. I told everybody. He did. Well, I know how much money we make. This is what we make here. This is what we make here. This is what we make he, he here. Gave, he gave away everything. Uh, everything. And I mean, he was like, up. and Doug, he was like exact. <laughs> there was no vagueness. <laughs> there was no vagueness whatsoever. He was like specific. So Doug gets audited this year. <laughs> Talked about Doug's new Lambo. Well, whatever. you know what's funny? No, he oh, man. Man. You imagine Doug having a <laughs> yeah, Lambo. His, his, his house in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> if anybody's going to get a Lambo, it's got to be Doug. It right? is going to be Doug. It's going to be Doug. But he won't tell anybody. He will. He'll park oh, it at some other totally house. totally silent he, about it. Buried gold. You know what, though? Actually, Sal and I both started our talk the same way, which is like, what if, you know, I try to think about what would I want want to hear yeah. from these guys uh, if I was in their shoes mm -hmm. and he went one way and but I thought the exact same way too and what I would want to know is about the business like mm -hmm. okay yep. the, I, I I look up to these guys I listen to their show I this I, I want to build something like them and so I see all these different things that they're involved in. So where are you making most of your money? What aren't you having a lot of success with? What are your failures and all those things? So that's where I went. I went that way. It's just like laid it all out for everybody. Like this is what's been really successful for us. These are things that may, you Here's may the think. the mistakes that we Yeah, made. you may uh -huh. think we're, we're making a lot of money here or having success here, but we didn't or we're not. And so I kind of like, I just laid it all out there and then turned mine more into like an interactive. Queue. Although I wrote something completely different when I got there and realized that, oh, all these people know who we are and what we're doing already. So I felt like the, the best thing I could give them was just more insight to. Well, I'm sure they we, appreciated that. Everybody loves transparency like that. Yeah. I, th I mean, that's, I got, must have got tagged on 15 different things of people saying that, like, I cannot believe uh, how much transparency that he had or what he talked about. Like, so, and I, cause I feel like everybody keeps that so close to the chest. Totally. They yeah. I, I think that I almost is a sign. In my for for me personally now there's boasting which is what Doug you know d doesn't like and that's not what you were doing right there's no, like the whole no. oh, I make this whatever which is stupid and I see people in our, our space doing that as well mm -hmm. but then there's this side which is if I was a new person in the space and I was trying to build business and mm -hmm. I see someone that I think is successful I would that would I would kill for that information like what, what does that look like and yeah. how does that work and the vagueness that people have sometimes in that scenario, yeah. it's weakness. It's how it comes across. Like right. they're afraid. It would be like if you went up to someone and you're like, man, how did you develop such an, you know, amazing arms? And like, well, you know, they don't want to tell you, I don't want you to build arms too. Cause I got the, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that weak. Well, I just think about like mindset. what it's been like for us to build the YouTube channel and like apparel. These are two like very common ways that people in our space try and make money. And they're like two of the worst ways we've yeah. made money in yeah. this business. So I just feel like that's really good information. If I'm thinking I'm going to get in the space, I see what my pump's doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, they got a half a million plus subscribers on one channel. They got another one that's growing at 150. Mm -hmm. I bet they're making this much money on that. They got all these cool clothes they're always wearing. I bet they're in like, yeah. it's like, well, no. Because you have the influencers and the mastermind people that take advantage of that. Yeah. That people think that's where you're going to make all your money. And so you'll get into this class. And they'll give you, you know, uh, they'll, they'll show you how to get a lot of followers and a yeah. lot of people like yeah. subscribing and all those things and all the hacks. And then you find out it's not really, you know, closing people on right. yeah. anything. Yeah. I'll tell you what's funny though. Whenever we do stuff like this, which we haven't done in a while, but I always catch at least a couple people doing this though. So what happens is, and we made this mistake. So people afterwards, they want to come and sh you know, talk to us and maybe take a picture. And it's, we separate some, which is oh, stupid yeah. because then people end up this. going, yeah, <laughs> we should stay together. But anyway, I'll hear people come up to, and I caught a couple of people that come up to me be like, Sal, you're my favorite host or whatever. And then I'll see them, <laughs> then I'll see them talking to Son Adam. Adam, you're my favorite host. I'm like, Hey, hold on. <laughs> oh yeah. You lied to me. Yeah. You said the same thing to me. Dude. <laughs> Dude. I've seen that happen. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah. And then one other thing, I know we're supposed to talk about Organifi. This is true now. I had a uh, a guy come up <laughs> this, to me. You say this is true now. That implies that everything you just said before. All the rest was, was a lie. Yeah, yeah, we were all the other stuff was bullshit. But this is true. We right weren't here. in Arizona. <laughs> no, I had this. Uh, Never happened. I had this trainer come up, and he's like, "Oh, I know you're the supplement guy." He goes, "What's the one supplement you take consistently?" And I said, "Well, creatine. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And then number two was the green juice." And he was shocked. He's like, "Really? You take the Organifi green juice?" I said, "That's actually one of the 
one of the only supplements that is a regular rotation in my and so he's asking me why and I'm like well it helps my digestion and I feel really good taking it it's just a general supplement that I take makes me feel now, good Now what do you what do you say to the people out there that try and shit on the green juices because that's one of those ones that's a, a little controversial like if people think that it's a waste of money and it's crap and it's it's why would you do that like and by the way I think we've always made it very clear like uh you're always better off eating real vegetables and whole foods That's why right, yeah. right? so That's what that's the issue it's just so. hard to do all the time Yeah, yeah. like I, if there's one thing that I probably don't do well enough in my diet is have a nice wide variety of vegetables. I tend to get stuck in this like three vegetable rotation. Well, I think, I think you're actually very normal. I think that's, if you prep your food, it, vegetables tend to be the thing that you lack like prepping. Yeah, it'll be like broccoli all soggy, over. soggy vegetables two yeah. days old are terrible. You have to do yeah. a day of or Yeah, like exactly. So like it's hard to get enough. Well, yeah. yeah and too, like after listening to Zach, you know, from uh, when he's talking about like uh, gut bacteria yeah. and, and how to make sure you like you keep it diverse and, 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 you, and you keep that up. That's hard to do. You have to really rotate and make sure that you're getting all these kind of nutrients coming in to feed different types of bacteria. So. Yeah. And I could get stuck in the bodybuilder mentality just because it's simple where it's like the same same foods all that I can easily and with vegetables that's the worst so I'll have like broccoli or asparagus or sometimes spinach but it's usually broccoli or asparagus all the time all the time yeah and so what the, the I think the green juice just has variety mm -hmm. and like I said it makes me feel good well that's I fine it, I was so. talking to organifi people at our party and I was like just raving about pure because it's it oh, literally yeah. is like i am like so hooked on it mm -hmm. and it's just because it's i mean i'm a i'm a stimulant guy already i don't need any more stimulus <laughs> to throw on top of what i'm doing yeah, yeah uh and i just need more clarity i need more focus i need like you know something to keep me sort of here in, you know in the present moment and it's really been one of those so things. speaking you know, of which by the way justin comes in this morning right and you know he drinks i don't know two cups of coffee probably by the way by the time he's here yeah, yeah. I've never seen anybody drink caffeine during their workout. So it's not even pre-workout. He grabs a, a drink and it's like 300 milligrams caffeine. Mm. And Sipping on it's, it. it's refreshing. Halfway through his workout, he starts <laughs> drinking. I'm like, dude, you doing a pre-workout for tomorrow? Like, why yeah. do you get more caffeine, bro? bro I, yeah, it's just, I'm at that point. You, you know, know, speaking of the pure thing, it, you know, it'd be kind of a fun experiment because it's actually been a while since I've consistently taken that. And I remember we talked about like when we when we first started trying it a lot, like the buildup effect of it. Yeah, I really noticed it when we were podcasting. And since I haven't for a while, this would be another good time for me to get consistent again. So you should, next time, you should start, how we used to do it, remember we used to all drink it before we started the podcast. Mm -hmm. Now that I, I, I haven't done it in a long time, I'd like to kind of tease that out and see if I notice okay. a difference in, in, uh, when, we, when we podcast. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Also, Maybe the specifics of eye pigment and all that. We'll get <laughs> yeah. that down. Yeah, yeah this yeah. time. By the way, guess who got uh, Time Magazine's Person of the Year? Huh? Someone we know? Well, I mean, Hillary everybody Clinton. knows this person. No, everybody knows this person. <laughs> But Jeffrey Epstein. I saw I saw a funny Elon Musk. That. Oh, oh really? Yes. And you know what? Oh, people are mad. Oh, there's some oh, people that are really angry. Oh, people are mad about what he just recently said about the uh, about the relief on the uh, what did he he just oh yeah I was talking about the huge spending bill yeah, yeah. and he goes you're taking it, the money away from people who allocate resources very yeah. efficiently effectively and you're giving it to the one entity that has a proven track record of terrible. Yes. Allocation. Which hey, is for the listener, simplify what that means because I think that's such a great point. And I was listening to a podcast today that we're, was talking about that, and it, it is so true. It is. So when you, ha first of all, nobody will spend money worse than the person who ha pays no consequences for spending it poorly. Meaning the government, right? They just don't pay any. And in fact, when they spend more money poorly, they make the case for more funding the next year because they say it's a money issue. In comparison to well, brilliant minds that built something out of nothing, is what you would say. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 not only that, but it, you know, asset allocation or resource resource allocation. It's really important. Like look at the cost. I forgot where it was. I think it was Seattle. They had this program to house the homeless and there was this private organization that was doing it. And then there was the government, the, the mm -hmm. city that was doing it. Yeah. And I think the cost per room or whatever from the city was something like 10 times more expensive than what this charity private organization can do mm -hmm. because of the amount of waste uh, that they, that they produce. So that's what he said. It pissed off a lot of people. But he's he's the person of the, the year. I'm actually surprised sometimes. that they named him because he's so controversial. Yeah. yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, he's he, that guy. I swear he's my favorite. Even oh. though I think Tesla stock is super bloated and and doesn't match anything uh, any fundamentals. Elon is. Uh, I mean, it matches the fundamentals of betting on a founder. Hundred mm. percent. 
Yeah. That's that's it right there. Yeah. It's because it's him. If he yeah. was gone, I don't think it would. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. In fact, I would think this stock would fucking tank if he were to all of a sudden decide I'm out of Tesla. Plum, for sure. It would plummet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's everybody is, is is banking on that is that he isn't done here. You know, he'll do that and then he'll go on to do something else. And so it's a it's a smart. He's bet. literally he's Tony Stark. He's a real world Tony Stark. We need Elon. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. Look, we have a partner called Live On Labs. They make some of the best supplements you'll find anywhere mainly because they put the supplements in a way to where your body will actually utilize and absorb them. One of the challenges of taking supplements and nutrients is you take them, they get destroyed in the gut, and then you have expensive urine. Well, Live On Labs uses liposomal technology to protect the active ingredients so they actually get to the tissues that you want them to get to. One of my favorite supplements is glutathione. In fact, they have one of the best glutathione types. It's liposomal. In fact, you might have heard of me talking about this in today's podcast. I use it daily. So go check them out. Head over to liveonlabs.com. That's L-I-V-O-N-L-A-B-S.com forward slash mind pump. And if you get on there and buy any product, you'll get a sample of all six of their products for free just because you listen to mind pump. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Mitch B. Smith. What are some ways to improve mind muscle connection? You know, the, the mind-muscle connection is something that bodybuilders talk about uh, all the time, right? It's being able to feel a muscle, a target muscle through uh, the you know range of motion, a particular exercise. They've actually done studies to show that people can improve the or increase the amount of muscle fibers that fire in muscles that they start to improve this connection to. So this is a good thing to focus on. This is where the value, the big value in isolation exercises comes from, in my opinion. Isometrics, you mean? Uh, isometrics and isolation. Yeah, I say isometrics are incredible for Excellent. Us. And, oh, yeah. So like compound lifts you so many different muscles that if you have a hard time, like for example, feeling your chest in a bench press, one of the best things you could do, in my opinion, is either an isometric squeeze of the chest or like a cable fly or something that isolates the chest mm -hmm. so you can feel it and then do your compound lift. So I think isometrics or isolation slowing the exercise down, going lighter. Those would be my three. Yeah, single joint, going slow, and really like paying attention to the feel. Uh, the first time I read this question, I remember like, uh, was it The Rock where it was just like, focus! Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, like just yells it out in the gym. But I think that people don't realize that's a major factor. Like we just kind of get in the rhythm and we get in the momentum of, of moving and exercising and we don't really pay attention totally. uh, you know, to what's at hand. And also too, if, if there is like a, a lagging body part or there's a lack of connectivity, you can increase that by simply, you know, really hyper-focusing on the squeeze and you know getting uh you know that recruitment process like more honed in on the only thing i would add to what you guys said is practice i mean when you think about an athlete who gets really good at throwing a ball it gets really, that's that's improving your mind muscle connection yeah. the ability to throw a perfect spiral super hard like tom brady does with the accuracy a lot of that mind muscle is improved mind muscle connection over years and years of throwing the ball and lots of repetition so uh, isometrics, isolation exercises, and then just flat out practicing that movement with the understanding of what your desired outcome is. So my yes. desired outcome is I want to squat, I want to fill it in my glutes. So doing those things that we're talking about, uh, isolation and isometric exercises to get the glutes to fire, but then also just practicing that movement, knowing I'm trying to fire the glutes. I'm glad you said that at the end because throwing a practicing to throw a football better would be more like mind to movement connection, mm -hmm. right? versus mind to muscle, which mind to muscle isn't doesn't necessarily mean better movement. Like mm. what I mean by that is a power lifter is constantly focusing on how to improve the efficiency and the leverage of a squat. They really don't care if they feel it in the quads, glutes, hams. It's like how can I squat more weight? How can I improve the skill of my squat so I can lift more? Versus someone who's like, man, I want to really build my butt. I can't feel my butt. It's not so much about using more leverage or it's really about feeling the target muscle, which is a different Creating feel. muscle tension. But pra like you said, Adam, practicing the connection yeah. often, right? So like if you have a poor connection to a muscle, every time you train this muscle with all the exercises, that should be the focus. Can I feel it? Can I feel it? Can I feel it? Not how much weight you lifted or you know how, you know, how great your performance was. Rather, how much better can I get this muscle? To and connect? even when you're not exercising, right? So that's what's great about things like trigger sessions. If you are yeah. practicing just activating that muscle, even with no resistance, totally. what is only going to make you better with that mind-muscle connection. Next question is from Tyler Cortez. 
are wrist wraps helpful long term or more detrimental? We used oh. to debate this a lot yeah. in the beginning. I think for the average person, detrimental. Yeah. Um, I, I could see value in advanced bodybuilders and lifters who know how good, to use that's them. a good way to put it i think yeah but i think the average person what what they do is first off they disengage the grip so you're not strength and by the way your your grip should be able to support pretty much any lift you do this is one of the strongest parts uh of the human body is your ability to hold on to things i mean we, we evolved we're primates for goodness sake so this is very strong but you're going to make your hands not strong enough to support your exercises if you're constantly using something that helps you hold on to the bar right. and Studies show that wrist wraps or straps or whatever you call them, the things that you, you go around your wrist and go around the bar, change recruitment patterns all the way up to the shoulder. Changes the way you fire your muscles yes. to, to accomplish that task. And I think that people don't realize that. It just, you naturally, wow, this feels a lot easier. And I feel like I can um, you know, really get a, a better hold and a better grasp on more weight. But uh, it doesn't translate then after not having wrist straps on. Yes. So now all of a sudden, I feel like I can do that 80-pound dumbbell, no problem. But guess what? Now there's a big uh, weak link in, in, in that that chain that goes all the way up, you know, into your arm. So now early on in the podcast, uh, I, I used to debate you guys a little bit on this and not because I don't, I don't disagree with everything you just said. Cause I do agree a hundred percent agree. But then at the same time too, you might catch me using wrist wraps. Yeah, well, you were, you were competing, you were bodybuilding. Right. And, yeah. and I think that way, and that's why the way you started it, I think is, I think over time we've refined how we, we present this message. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect way to say it. It's like for the most, for the most people and the at general population, it's, it's going to hinder them. It's not ideal for them at all. And you should avoid it at all costs. But for an advanced lifter who has very specific goals and has got a great developed physique, I, there's some application for it. And there's been plenty of times in my career where I've pulled them out to use them because I'm I don't want my forearms to be the limiting factor. Like, and I, even though yes, practicing with the grip would be better for my grip, but I'm a bodybuilder. I'm trying to get my rear delt at that at that right. moment to fire. I don't care if my forearms aren't firing or getting developed at that moment. I'm trying to develop a very specific thing, and I don't want anything else to get in the way of that. And so there's times when there's some application, but talking to the general population. Uh, and and by the way, I haven't used wrist, wrap, wrist wraps in a couple of years now. Well, you're now. not bodybuilding. Yeah, anymore. I don't care right now. Yeah. Right now, I'm not like into the body sculpting thing right now. I'm just training to be healthy and fit. And because of that, if I can't hold on to something that's over 350 pounds, I don't deadlift it because yeah. so it, does, it doesn't matter to me anymore. Yeah, here's the places I'd say that were probably... It, where, where people will use it, right? So uh, high-level bodybuilders who are doing these high-volume workouts, you know, they're doing 20 sets for back and they're already really well-developed and they know how to isolate and squeeze and they get plenty of hand and grip work and everything else that they do. Strongman competitors use wrist wraps often because the competitions allow them to sometimes. Right. So you'll often see them do these lifts. Those power lifters. Yeah. Power lifters don't use them because power lifters have to use their grip. Well, yeah, competitive power lifters, yeah. yeah but the, uh, you see your weekend warrior guys doing all Yes, time. yes. Uh, that's a big problem. It's an ego lift for yeah. those ones, I yeah. guess. Now, I use them rarely, but here's when I'll use them. Let's say I'm going to do a heavy, stiff-legged deadlift. I'm not, I'm not working my upper body. I'm trying to work my hamstrings. So, and I have 400 pounds on the bar and I already did a conventional deadlift early in the week. What I'm trying to do there is actually use my arms less. Well, that that's my rear delt example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You are trying, you are trying to isolate, even though it's impossible to isolate a muscle, but you're trying to put as much emphasis on your hamstrings. Yeah. And what you don't want is your forearms to limit you. Yes. Or overtrain and, my forearms. Right. And because you're an advanced lifter who has got a balanced physique and has strong forearms, then to me, it makes sense. And that's how I felt when we used to talk about this early in the podcast, you guys used to give me shit all the time. And I'd be like, well, listen, yeah. I'm, I, I feel like I can defend why I use it because I don't use it all the time, but then there have been specific moments. But when we're talking to the general population, I think yeah, most well, people I just should always avoid it. caution because either way you look at it, you're going to cause dysfunction. And that's just something that you're going to have to work your way back and you're going to have to repair. And eventually it's going to sneak up and bite you in the ass. So if you are competitive with it, there's a window for that. Sure. Yep. Um, well, but you have to ask yourself too, what's a lesser evil? Someone to do an over uh, over under grip on a deadlift or a wrist wrapped deadlift? It depends who it is. Most people, I would say, you use your switcher over under back and forth. Yeah. Which yeah. nobody grip. does, right? Unless yeah. you're us. Yes, or, you're, yeah. but, <laughs> or you're a purist. Who, who have you seen? Of double Right, the whole yeah. time. A lot of people do yeah. uh, over under and to go max lift, and I would it going and I used to. Okay, I'm guilty of this, but looking back now, I actually 
probably should I would have rather because the, the issues that I have are shoulder and upper it's back because you stuff. always kept the same hands that's right so did I. that's right yeah. and so since I'm not switching back and forth which most people don't I probably would have been better off of using wraps in that situation that's, this is why being. I switched to hook grip is exactly but it took me six months to get my hook grip to be able to handle the weight that I could use with a alternate grip yeah I, I've never given clients wrist straps never. either have I yeah I've never had yeah. them use them at all and and by the way bodybuilders don't care about function. That's the other thing we need to real, realize. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not a factor. No, they don't care. Like, oh, great, great. It's changing the recruitment pattern in my, you know, my shoulders. Or okay, my hands can't handle the twenty sets I do for my back. I don't care. I'm yeah. going on stage, yeah, yeah. so it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Next question is from just a girl in her Jeep. Should I use a weight belt or just work on strengthening my core and proper breathing? Yeah, very, very similar, similar to that. question. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, same answer. If you're going to use a belt in competition, then you're going to want to train with a belt because it's a specific skill and it's a specific core recruitment pattern. Everybody else avoid belts. By the way, this is coming from someone who uses heavy uh, a weight belt when I do heavy deadlifts or squats. Why do I use a belt for heavy deadlifts and squats? I did it for so long that I don't feel like taking two years out of my training to train myself to not use it. That's literally how long it'll take. I've yeah. been training since I was a kid. And when I was, I think I was 15 or 16, that's the story I talk about when I ran into those power lifters. And they're the ones that, oh, you got to use a belt or whatever. So then from 16 till you know now, I've been using this belt. And I've gone through stints without, without using it. And I know it would literally take me a couple years of training without a belt. And I don't care at this point. But to the average person... You're better, way better off developing the type of core stability that you need to train without a belt. And it's different. When your core braces without a belt, it's a different recruitment pattern mm -hmm. than when it braces with a belt. When it braces with a belt, it pushes out against the belt. That does not do that. Well, when you it's don't interesting have the belt on. you say that because I'm probably in the opposite uh, uh, where I've actually done It's been maybe since high school where the last time I've really like trained with a belt and like heavy mm -hmm. squats and. Um, like I feel like I've lost that ability to, uh, brace that way by pushing out. And so like, that would be like so unnatural for me that it would like take me forever to go through the process of, you know, like working in that, uh, you know, when I squat. So, uh, I think again, this is, this is, uh, one of those things, like if, if you're competing with it, it makes sense. Um, and it's, it's just at one of those things. I don't think that you need it if you train and develop it all the way up without one, but um, there's, again, there's places for it. Yeah. yeah. This is the same answer for me as the last question. Um, again, I, you, the last time I used a belt, you probably can look back on my Instagram and actually see, cause I would put, do post of showing the audience like, Hey, I'm using a belt today just yeah. to test my strength. Right. Um, I don't care about that right now. I'm not trying, I'm nowhere near my top strength on any of my lifts right now. So I haven't used a belt in whatever that post is. I'm going to guess it's been well over a year or two since I've probably used it. Um, but again, intermittently, I use that just like straps. There was, there's was, there been times, when, same just like my shoes. Uh, for the most part, 90% of my training is, you know, flat shoes and or, or barefoot and strapless and beltless. But all four of those things I utilize occasionally. And a lot of times I do it because purely for ego. I want to see what I can put up that day. I want to see if I have a little bit of support underneath my uh, my heels so I don't so my, it doesn't stress my ankle mobility as much. I got plenty of room. Uh, I want to feel that. Uh, sometimes I want to throw the belt on and maybe stack an extra 50 pounds on there just to feel that heavy ass weight. Sometimes I lifted really, really heavy the day before. My forearms are fried, but I still want to rip deadlifts and I get the straps out. But yep. very, very rarely especially right now since my goals are not geared around aesthetics or strength really right now it's more about health um and then back to a point one of you made already i've never had a client utilize a belt or straps i've only had now, a couple yeah, yeah now you've done a lot of work with your ankle mobility and that's been more secure and you're you got the depth to go with that and everything now in, in terms of each one of those aids which one do you think now after putting work in uh, you'd probably see the most help from that aid versus maybe one doesn't have quite as much of an impact. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, and it, one, I think we would have to first break down the lift, right? So if we were depends talking- depends on the lift, huh? Right. Yeah. yeah. So like if it's a deadlift, the belt, it's yeah, gotta be, or the right. straps. Yeah. The straps. Yeah. yeah. Arguably the straps. Cause I'd say right now, my limiting factor of doing 400 pounds would not be my core or back. It would be my, my hands mm. probably couldn't hold 400 pounds right now, but I think my back and hamstrings and glutes are strong enough. Um, the, the, uh, 
the shoes are big were way bigger than I ever thought. Sal introduced me to uh yeah, heels. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> he got Ironically me. the he yeah, introduced yeah. heels of the shoe guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had never I had never used squat shoes in my life before. This is where this is pre Adam knows he has a ankle mobility problem, right? So I didn't I didn't I didn't recognize it yet. And I thought, well, that's so weird. What what why would these help? I did it and I was like, whoa, I felt so much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But that also what what led me to realize like, oh shit, I have an issue with ankle mobility. Yep. All he did was raise my heels up, and all of a sudden the squat felt Same better. Same here. I did him, and I'm like, why am I squatting better? I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. That's why I have flat feet. So now when I actually – so to get to your point, Justin, if I go back, like let's say squatting right now, because I can get really good deep, a depth barefoot right now pretty comfortably. It does feel a little more comfortable with with, uh, with squat shoes because you obviously have – I have even more room. But it doesn't. I don't feel like it. Like I'm not adding any more weight really yeah. anymore because of the heels. Where in the pat the squat shoes would I could be, add more weight because right. of the squat shoes. Not anymore. Okay. The belt though, uh, I can still get probably another 25 pounds up because of that, and so that would help me in squatting big time. Actually, so I feel the belt. You brought up deadlifting. The belt helps me more with squatting. Uh, the straps would help me more with deadlifting. Mm -hmm. For the, so, um, but very minimal, and I don't care now. So I don't actually use any of them ever right now. Next question is from Cole Kosnick. Are there any proven benefits to taking ashwagandha? Yeah, that's that's actually a pretty well-studied supplement. It's got lots of benefits. It raises testosterone in men with low testosterone. Um, and it's got this it's hormone. Also, it's also in your green juice you were talking about earlier, It is. Right? It's in the Organifi green juice. They put our, our, uh, ashwagandha in there. And it, it's got this hormone balancing effect to where it's called an adaptogen because the negative effects that you get from a lot of stress can be quite blunted by supplementing with ashwagandha. It's almost like it gets your body to utilize cortisol better so your body doesn't raise cortisol as much. So you see studies that where it'll lower cortisol in, in high-stressed individuals. You, you see studies showing that it improves recovery and strength and muscle gains in athletes. It's one of those few like natural supplements that has a pretty good effect. Now, there may be cases where you don't want to take ashwagandha. I think if you have like a nightshade allergy or intolerance, you probably don't want to supplement with ashwagandha. But it's it's like, okay, so you know how ginseng is for, for Chinese medicine? Like ginseng is like the king, you know, of, of supplements or herbs or whatever in Chinese medicine. Ashwagandha is like that for Ayurvedic medicine. It's one of those like vitality, libido, energy, strength, uh, recovery improves sperm motility and sperm production in men. So it's a pretty phenomenal supplement. It's one of the it's one of the things that you'll probably if you have everything else dialed so this in. This is a herb. Like what kind of plant is this? Oh, I don't remember. I don't know what it looks it's like. A plant or I know root. It, is it a root? A root? Yeah, I know it smells. It's I think in fact Yeah, if you do the pure I've had the pure stuff which blows my mind. You mean the Again, liquid? Yeah, the yeah, liquid. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it tastes like uh, like alcohol or I something think you're taking. If I'm not mistaken, like rubbing alcohol. They called it I think if I'm not mistaken, in Ayurvedic medicine, they call it like horse piss or something like that because it smelled <laughs> really bad or they make comments. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have I have the dropper at home. Um, I had I got that before we started working with Organifi and their their green juice, and it's like oh my god, it's it's gnarly. Yeah, it's um, it's not I, a root, Doug. Yeah, it's a root. Oh, yeah, there it is, right there. Mark okay. one up, Doug. For me. Look up yep. uh, like like ashwagandha like horse pee or horse something because it was like this funny now do you uh what what's your thoughts on maybe that's why you feel so good on the green juice do you think that that may be playing uh, as much or more of a role than the fact of you just getting your vegetables that you you're... it's all of it it's all i love ashwagandha it's it's a supplement that i'll cycle in mm -hmm. uh to my supplement regime you know what's really good with ashwagandha is a stimulant because it's got that natural stress balancing effect so if you're taking like a really strong pre-workout, take like a little bit of ashwagandha with it and you get this nice balancing effect. I notice uh, recovery from it. Really, yeah. like I can definitely increase my volume if I'm supplementing uh, with ashwagandha. So it's a, it's a very interesting supplement. If you have issues with cortisol, um, you may want to ad get advice from a, a practitioner, an expert, because I know it definitely can change the way your body, body utilizes cortisol, which may be one of the reasons why it's known as this kind of adaptogenic um, herb. Uh, but yeah, it's one of those. So great do you think it'd be equal in terms of like uh, mushrooms and their uh, sort of uh, like adaptogenic, yeah, cordyceps type of a, an effect, or is it a little bit even greater? The studies are better with ashwagandha right now. Mm. You know, oh, really? Yeah. You know, it's, it, what's interesting though, 
um, with herbs is that they can have a pretty interesting, different effect from person to person. So like uh, red, they call it red panax ginseng, right? That's the like the real because there's American ginseng. Those aren't real ginsengs. They call them that, but the real ginseng is this red panax kind of uh, Chinese ginseng, and it's got this you know supposed to be stimula stimulating effect, and it's got adaptogenic properties. I take ginseng and I feel I don't feel good. It makes me hot and feverish, and mm. I feel kind of bogged down. I had a Chinese uh, herbalist tell me that it was because I had a lot of yang energy and it just makes your yang go up even more. And so I was unbalanced. That's the way they explained it. Um, rhodiola can yeah, do that to me. hot, right? And that's how somebody described it to me. Something like that, right? Too, yeah. uh, rhodiola is like that too. Rhodiola is a stimulant. It's got great uh, studies. That one, that rhodiola can make me feel like crap too. I feel like shit when I take that. Yeah, I I've tried that so many times thinking You and it. I both. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. can do that to me too. Ashwagandha, I feel great. Um, but again, it's there's this, it's interesting with some of these herbs, how with some people they can feel great and other people can't. And the reason why I'm saying this is don't do what I did, which is, you know, when I was younger, I would read these studies and I would take the supplement and I'd be so hard headed about it. So I'd be like, I feel like crap, but I'm going to keep taking it. Not realizing like, oh, it's probably this this herb that I'm taking that's supposed to be great, but it's making me you feel like You should find us like a super woo-woo person to come on here and like break down like all the herbs. Yeah. You know what the problem with uh, yeah practitioner yeah like, someone like who's like a, a woo woo and all of it you know well, what I'm saying they name? can just be like what's his name our tell functional practitioner guy that we've had on a couple times oh so would he be able to break it down Steve Cabral Steve Dr Cabral is, yeah. he's an expert you know what the problem is is that if if they talk in Ayurvedic terms or they talk in Chinese medicine terms yeah, people will scoff at it well not that they're going to talk about like eh, who cares we'll t we'll yeah. take care of that but I, see what I want to do is I want to see like the actual. Uh, you know, double blind placebo controlled studies, mm -hmm. and I want someone to break those down. There's a lot of them, right? Well, that's what I mean. But I want somebody, somebody who under, who knows that, yeah. right? That can tell us, like, like you just asked a great question, like, what would what is considered better, cordyceps or ashwagandha? Yeah. Now, you gave kind of your personal opinion on yeah. that, but I love someone to say, like, oh no, there's way more research to support this for these reasons, and. But, I mean, it would be cool to have someone like that. Yeah, on I'm there. with you on that. Yeah. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Instagram, in fact. Uh, you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 